The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Welcome back to our ongoing study of the book of Romans. We're about to conclude Romans chapter 1. Before we take a look at the last few verses of that chapter, I'd like to remind us of some of the things we've been talking about leading up to this particular study. When humanity abandons God, our thinking tends toward nihilism. What Jesus offers at the cross is a way of changing our thinking, a discovery, of meaning and purpose. In our pride, we have in the past substituted false gods for the one true God, understanding that religion helps bind society together. Unfortunately, these false gods and goddesses did not inspire us to live any better. With idolatry, humanity drifted farther from God by abandoning his design for our lives, including his design for the sexual relationship. As we will see in the final study of chapter 1, normalizing homosexuality was representative of the immorality rife in Gentile cultures. Let's pick up in chapter 1, verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. As I mentioned in my introduction, Paul argues that man's departure from faith in a designer leads to a departure from his design, from faith in his design. In the first century Gentile world, this departure from God was best characterized by two things. First, the proliferation of idolatry, and second, rampant sexual immorality. Paul says women left the natural use for what is against nature and men left the natural use of the woman. Now I understand the word nature to mean, according to God's design, or God's intent, as revealed in nature. And simple observation would lead us to the conclusion that biological human females are intended to mate with biological human males. As we discussed in the last lesson, God designed sex for heterosexual marriage, and homosexuality is a departure from God's design. Which leads us to a very important and essential question. Are people born with homosexual desire? I must confess, I have found the development of desire to be an extremely complicated topic. I do plan to address it, Lord willing, when we arrive in chapter 6 and 7. I think that that's the appropriate place in the book of Romans to discuss the development of desires. However, I do think it's worth noting that in response to my first question, are people born with homosexual desire, most in our day and age would respond with a yes. But it's important, I think, to consider what the American Psychological Association says on their website under the heading of human sexuality. Quote, There is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Many think that nature and nurture both play complex roles, 
most people experience little or no sense of choice about their sexual orientation. End quote. I'm recording this lesson in the fall of 2020. It will be published on YouTube and on Facebook in the spring of 2021. I first taught on the topic of homosexual orientation over a decade ago. I consulted the same website, the American Psychological Association, in my research. Their answer has not changed in over 10 years. And the answer is quite simple. Are people born with homosexual desire? No one knows for sure. No one knows how sexual orientation develops. I am personally not convinced that one is born genetically predisposed to homosexuality. Now that may be the case, and in time that may prove to be a fact. But the evidence, in my mind, is inconclusive, even at this late date, even with the amount of research that has been dedicated toward this end. I am not persuaded that a person is born genetically predisposed toward homosexuality. I believe what the Bible teaches, that homosexual orientation, homosexual desire, like all other sins, is rooted in our desires. Remember verse number 24. The dishonoring of the body is an acting out of the lusts of the heart. Again in verse 27, homosexual men burned in their lust for one another. Fornication, of which homosexuality is just one form, proceeds out of the heart, according to Jesus, and defiles the guilty. Matthew chapter 15, verses 19 and 20. And above all, please remember the words of James. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. God is neither the source of our desires, nor is he the one who tempts us. Our desires come from within, and we sin when we give in to that desire. Again, I will say, how that desire develops, I am not entirely certain. But no one else is either. It's a complicated topic. But it's important for us to remember, at this moment that like all other sins, Christ gives us the victory over homosexual desire. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul warns the church about sins which will keep them from the kingdom of God, among which are passive homosexual partners and practicing homosexuals. That phrase is taken from the New English Translation. The Apostle goes on to say, some of you once lived this way. You once were homosexual. Some among the Corinthians practiced homosexuality. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is verse number 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, also quoted from the New English Translation Bible. There were Christians in Corinth who previously practiced homosexuality, but for the sake of Christ, they departed. The answer for homosexuals and for all of us is to walk by faith in Jesus Christ, to be led by the Spirit. And when we walk by faith, when we are led by the Spirit, we can leave our old lives behind. Paul also points out in this passage that God has integrated consequences in order to curb fornication. Paul says concerning Gentile homosexuals, they received in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. For the Jew, the most basic function of the old law was to institute moral parameters to help stabilize Jewish society. But the Gentiles were living apart from divine revelation. And 
Because they lived apart from divine revelation, they were at a disadvantage. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says this, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. The writer of that particular proverb acknowledges that when God has not revealed himself, when there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. So the Gentiles were at a disadvantage living apart from the law. But God did not leave the Gentile world entirely without restraint. We all live under the divine principle of sowing and reaping. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Sexual practices which deviate from God's design for sex are often accompanied by greater elements of danger and consequence. For example, those who specialize in sexual addictions have noticed a pattern of increasing deviancy in the behaviors of addicts. The longer the addiction lasts, the more likely the addict will expose him or herself to increasingly deviant or dangerous behavior. And the element of danger introduces an excitement that sinks the claws of addiction ever more deeply into the heart of the addict. And the consequences for this type of addiction are devastating. Besides the obvious threat of transmissible disease, family relationships are strained and destroyed, bank accounts are wiped out, jobs are lost, reputations are destroyed, and the list goes on and on. And that's just in the realm of sexual addiction. Homosexuality is a dangerous activity. According to a National Institute of Health study in 2015, this is just five years ago from the recording of this video. According to a National Institute of Health study in 2015, male homosexuals remain the most likely to contract a sexually transmitted infection. Now, heterosexual monogamy is without question the route which carries the least amount of dangers to its practitioners. But in our defiance, Western civilization has expended immense resources over the last 80 years in an attempt to make the world safe for fornication. We're trying to eliminate those consequences that God has programmed into his design. Homosexuality is a departure from God's design, and it is rooted in human desires. Now, as I look at these last few verses in chapter 1, I notice that there is an increasingly deteriorating moral state. Notice the language Paul uses beginning in verse 24. He says, God gave them up. In verse 26, he reiterates, God gave them up. In verse 28, God gave them over. If God is loving, why would he give up on his creation? Why would he deliver his creation over to depravity and certain destruction? Scripture consistently depicts man in need of God. We long for something or someone beyond us. Solomon claimed God has put eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. Jesus promises us in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And later, Jesus stands up while celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem. And in John chapter 7 verses 37 and 38, he invites... Anyone who thirsts, anyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Scripture consistently depicts us in need of God. We long for something or someone beyond us. We attempt to satisfy that desire with sin. God asks those who spiritually thirst, why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what will not satisfy? 
Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Isaiah 55 verse 2. So man was filling his heart with things that would not satisfy and God asks the simple question, why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your time on pursuits that will not satisfy you in the end? Later on in the 65th chapter of Isaiah, God warns of the emptiness, the lack of fulfillment idolaters would experience in their worship. He says this in verse 11, But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering for Mini. In verses 13 and 14, he says to the idolaters, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall shout, pardon me, shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. The message is simple. Sin deceives us. It promises to fulfill while only increasing our desire for sin. And in sin, we are trying to fill a God-sized hole in our heart. Habitual, unrestrained sinfulness creates a callousness to immorality. Why does God give people over? Why does he give them up? Because we try to fill our lives with things that will not satisfy, and the more we do it, the farther away we drift from God. Habitual, unrestrained sinfulness creates a callousness to immorality. God asked the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. In the preceding verses, God condemns the rampant oppression, violence, and injustice of his people. Judah, God says, should be ashamed. Sadly, they have become so callous for sin, they are incapable of demonstrating their sorrow for sin. It's like what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 2, talking about those who have given themselves over to pursuing false doctrine and false teaching. They have their own conscience seared with a hot iron. When a rancher brands livestock with a hot iron, the heat cauterizes the skin and destroys the nerve endings. All sensation and feeling in that piece of skin is lost. Our conscience, our capacity for discerning good and evil and to feel a sense of guilt for sin, our conscience can be damaged in a similar manner by persistent sinfulness. This is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19, that the Gentile world was past feeling. Those who struggle with the addictive behaviors, with habitual sin, Describe it as being in a trance sometimes, like a virtual out-of-body experience. They've lost all feeling. Sin affects us in more ways than a moment of pleasure or a thrill. Over time, it robs us of our capacity to discern right from wrong. We come to no longer feel any sense of guilt. So God reaches a point at which he gives us exactly what we want. Scripture consistently depicts God as patient. He bears with us in all of our imperfections in order to draw more people to him. Peter talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, and we'll talk about it in the next video, Lord willing. God is patient. He bears with us. He is trying to draw us to him by his goodness. However, Although God suffers long, his patience with us is not indefinite. He sets a limit on how long he will endure persistent sinfulness. Let's just step back for a moment to consider the picture that Paul has painted since verse 18. The Gentile world has suppressed what can be intuitively discovered about God's existence, 
They willfully denied God the glory he was due and were unthankful for the good ways he had blessed them. In their pride, they worshipped what God created rather than the creator, preferring easy lies rather than hard truths. Their denial of God contributed to a spiraling immorality, culminating with an abandoning of God's design for human sexual relationships. Is it reasonable? Is it reasonable for God to continue enabling such hard-hearted, willful, rebellious sinfulness in the name of love, mercy, and grace? Is it God truly loving? Is God truly loving if he allows his creation to irreparably damage itself? And as we are about to see, the Gentile world was hopelessly mired in sin. Let's continue in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malici maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Once again, Paul connects the Gentiles' intransigent resistance to faith in a creator to a corruption of the intellect. This culminates in verse 28. Their refusal to retain God in their knowledge led to a debased mind. Highlighting the relationship between a lack of faith to the corruption of an intellect. Highlighting that relationship was pertinent to those living in a world which was all consumed with acquiring and exploring knowledge. Greeks seek after wisdom, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. Luke says of the Athenian Areopagus, for all the Athenians and the foreigners, foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Acts 17 verse 21. Paul was very critical of the Greek obsession with human wisdom. He argues God purposely chose to sacrifice his son via crucifixion to put to shame the wise. 1 Corinthians 1 27. Paul deliberately avoided persuasive words of human wisdom when presenting the gospel to the Corinthians so that their faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And in the second chapter of Colossians, Paul warns the church about the creep of human philosophy into the doctrine of Christ. Its encroachment signaled a shift toward the carnal. The apostles saw causal links between the Gentiles defying the testimony of creation by choosing human wisdom over faith in God. He sees a connection between that and the proliferation of immorality. This intransigence created a feedback loop. Their denial of God's existence suppressed the truth, the depth of their immorality, as described in verses 29 through 31, further reinforced the suppression of truth. And in my mind's eye, Paul's analysis is circular. It's not linear. The Gentiles being filled with all unrighteousness is not an end, but rather serves to justify and encourage their denial of God. They deny God, they give in to immorality, and then that feeds back on their denial of God. It's circular, not linear. Verses 29 through 31 contains an extensive list of the Gentile sins. Rather than go through each one of these individually, I plan to just choose a few that I think are particularly relevant. Verses 
In verse 29, Paul describes the, the maliciousness of the Gentile world. Malice is when anger, when our anger towards another person leads us to desire their hurt or their injury. It's related to what Paul says in verse 29, what he calls evil-mindedness, or what another translation renders as hostility. What begins as malice in the heart can then turn into malice, maliciousness in action, hostility in action, if you will. So the Gentile world was overtaken by malice. They were malicious. They were also haters of God, verse 30. When warning about covetousness, Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. The Gentiles did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted to serve their own desires. Their hatred or resentment of God was the natural result. They wanted to serve themselves, so... By choosing themselves, they became haters of God. Paul also says in verse 30 that the Gentile world had become inventors of evil things. Or as another translation puts it, contrivers of all sorts of evil. They were using the imagination God had given them to design new ways to commit evil acts. He also says in verse 30 that the Gentile world was disobedient to their parents. In Ephesians 6 verses 2 and 3, Paul observed the command to honor one's father and mother was the first command incentivized by a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Intact, functional family units composed of a father and mother with children leads to a flourishing society. But generations of rebellious children who actively dishonor their parents is a sign of a society in decay. In verse 31, he says that the Gentile world was undiscerning. They can no longer see the difference between right and wrong. Also in verse 31, he says they had become unforgiving or unmerciful. And that's certainly a quality we can see in our day. The more our morality declines and devolves, the less forgiving we become. Remarkably, the Gentile world, in spite of its deep state of depravity, did retain a sense of a day of reckoning. In verse 32, Paul says, "...who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death." This alludes to a sense of, of expecting a day of accountability. Plato, in Book 10 of The Republic, describes a judgment scene where the just and unjust were separated and sent to destinations of reward and punishment, respectively. In Virgil's Aeneid, Anchises describes how the evil are scourged by torments and pay the price for former sins. Some are hung, stretched out to the hollow winds, the taint of wickedness is cleansed for others, and vast gulfs are burned away with fire. Each spirit suffers its own. Now, when we look at these examples more closely, we see these are more precursors to the concept of purgatory. They are depicted as temporary sentences after which the guilty are released to the Greek concept of heaven. However, they lead me to believe that in spite of the hopelessly sinful state of the Gentile world, they retained an inclination for a day when human beings would individually answer for their evil following death. So the Gentile intuitively anticipated God's righteous judgment and recognized that there was a just penalty for sins. They know the righteous judgment of God. They know that so, the people who practice such things are deserving of death. That sense had been retained. But Paul concludes his analysis with this observation. Those who know the righteous judgment of God not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Paul's diagnosis is the Gentiles know to do better 
and yet choose to do otherwise. As I was getting ready to put this video together, I asked a psychologist for her interpretation of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. I thought it would be interesting to see how a, a Bible-believing psychologist would interpret this passage. She believes it aligns with something called cognitive dissonance theory. This theory proposes that when we do something we know to be wrong, it creates tension, tension inside of us. To resolve the tension or dissonance, we must either act according to what we know to be right or to change our belief in some way. Paul's description of the Gentile world is cognitive dissonance writ large. Humanity intuitively knows there is a creator. From this knowledge, a morality flows. We know he will hold us accountable, and yet we pursue our own desires, thus creating the tension or dissonance. To justify our pursuit of unrighteousness, we create alternative belief systems which resolve the internal conflict. But it's imperative to note that this tension can be resolved in two ways. We can align our behavior with beliefs. If we intuitively know God exists, then we know that there is a morality which exists, and I should act accordingly. A change in action will resolve that internal tension. But more often than not, human beings choose to alter their beliefs in order to suit their desires. I want to act the way I want to act. Morality is malleable. Therefore, I need to find a God or a church or a religion or an ideology that allows me to pursue the ends I desire. To further compound the problem, we encourage others to pursue a similar course. We approve of their immorality and thereby affirm our own sinfulness, thus creating a self-affirming feedback loop. What I'm doing is okay because everybody's doing it. Everyone's doing it, so I'm okay. And this is Paul's analysis of the Gentile world. Rather than aligning their actions with belief in a creator, they chose to change their beliefs so that they could pursue their own desires. And at the end, they are left not only destitute, but also celebrating all the destitution around them. So as I draw this video to a close, I'll take just a moment to summarize what I discussed. Homosexuality is a departure from God's design that is rooted in human desire. Homosexuality was just one sign the Gentile world had turned itself away from God to the degree that God turned himself away from them by loosening their restraints. Immorality was rife in the Gentile world. However, in the midst of it all, the Gentiles retained a sense of ultimate accountability. But they ignored their sense by proceeding to fulfill their own desires and encouraged others to do likewise.